Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to East Central Missouri and the world, and welcome to the James Strong Show podcast, podcast number 297. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for making us a part of your day. I appreciate it. This podcast was recorded on the morning of Friday, December the 23rd, from the James Strong Studio in Western St. Charles County. Got the day off of work from the day job, so I thought, you know what? It's uh, it's currently zero degrees outside. <laughs> it got down to seven degrees here in East Central Missouri last night. I'm not going outside, except for, uh, I mean, at least not right now. Uh, I haven't even shoveled my driveway yet. Granted, there's not much snow out there, but uh, I always pride myself on being the uh, the first one to get my driveway shoveled. Uh, is it a contest? Is it a game? Is it a competition? I don't know. Uh, I kind of think it is, but I don't think that any of my neighbors participate. So if it's a competition of one, I don't know if you would call it a a, a competition or just uh, my anal retentive self wanting to get something done before others do, but uh, not shovel the driveway yet. Uh, much later than normal, but I will tell you this. No one else has done it yet either, so I still have the champ chance to be the champion of the drive, driveway shoveling neighborhood competition. <laughs> Film at 11 on that one. Uh, yeah, the weather's uh, unbelievably cold here. Uh, I saw the I saw the, 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 the big news story. Oh, this is going to be the storm of a once in a generation. I thought to myself, but there's not much snow. In fact, we probably got here one maybe maybe two inches of snow and that that might be a push okay so i'm thinking this is not a big deal well it is a big deal and not a big deal because of the amount of snowfall it was a big deal because of the temperature uh minus seven degrees with 40 mile an hour (coughs) wind gusts with a wind chill of minus 35 yeah that's a big deal Uh, is it unprecedented? No. Have we had this before? Yes, but almost never here in, uh, (coughs) pardon me here in this part of the country, we do get below zero. I would say it gets below zero here, maybe three times out of five years, once or twice and below zero usually means minus one, minus two, minus three tops. But this time has been uh, a big deal. Minus seven with 40 or 40 mile an hour wind gusts, that's a big deal. So the weather has been a big deal. Uh, <clears throat> that being said, uh, we're all staying inside. And I'm off for a four-day uh, holiday weekend. So I thought, what the heck, let's do a uh, let's do a podcast. I did one on Monday night. I'm doing one on Friday morning. So actually twice in one week. Here we go. Um an update on the 1951 Jaguar Mark 7 that put some uh, a photo up on Facebook visited the guys who are doing the engine work and the body work before they give it back to me so I can put the thing back together and get it running uh, we're getting closer uh, I, I know we get closer all the time but the engine is not only finished but it's practically together all the parts the gaskets and all that have been purchased much of the engine has been put back together all the parts with all the corrosion and, and gunk and mud and nastiness have been uh, vapor blasted and cleaned. They were all good. None had holes in them. Uh, so after vapor blast, blasting and cleaning, they're now it's now being reassembled. And as you can see on my Facebook page, it's looking very, very nice. Um, I don't even want to tell you about an ETA, <laughs> mainly because... I was supposed to get that thing uh, in December of, of 2023, which is, which is, which is actually 2022, which is now a year from ago. And then uh, they said that uh, maybe probably June or July 2022. Well, that didn't happen either. And I get it; things happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really behind schedule, uh, behind schedule, over budget. From but from what I understand, this kind of stuff always is but we're getting closer. If you want to see how close, check out my Facebook page. Got a picture of the engine right there. And this engine, for those of you who, who are, are engine nuts or know or, or know anything at all about this stuff, um, 
This car is from 1951, and the engine is a 2.4 liter dual overhead cam engine with a cast iron block and aluminum head. Friends, U.S. makers didn't do this until the 1990s or into the 2000s on a regular basis. Uh, this engine in this car, when it came out in 1951, in 1951, this car was the fastest production sedan made in the world. And Jaguar actually built this engine from the late 40s up until the mid to late 70s on a regular basis. So it's a it's a some rendition of that engine, okay? So that uh, the 3.4 liter XK engine, uh, they bumped it up to a six or two or three point six, I think even a three point eight, but basically same engine. They've made this thing a lot, which good for me. The parts aren't that terribly expensive because there's so many of them out there. Uh, some of the parts aren't very expensive. Let's just say that. Anyway, I'm anxious to get this thing in the car, which the car looks great. The paint is done. I'm anxious to get it in the car, running and driving on the street. So uh, there's your update on the 51 Jaguar Mark 7. Topic of today's essay today, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, the movie, which everybody's playing this nowadays uh, on, on the television. We're going to talk a little bit about that movie and why why it's actually on the television a lot, okay? And the reason that, that you see this thing on all the time may surprise you okay and uh anyway that that's part one to the essay it's a wonderful life comma but not if you're in russia okay we're gonna talk a little bit about the russian ukraine war and and what russia is doing to its people at the I mean, to try to win this war against ukraine uh one more thing i want to talk about before we get into the essay though is uh I've started my winter reading routine, and I do this every year. Uh, I get on a topic, and I choose a topic, and I begin to read books about that topic. And this year, it's a little bit different. Um, I'm reading about, I'm reading biographies about Hollywood stars from the golden age of motion pictures. I uh, finished a book on Sophia Loren. I'm currently reading a book on Cary Grant. And the things you read about these people, what these books tend to do is humorize, I'm sorry, humanize the actor. Uh, Everybody knows about Sophia Loren. Yeah, she was married to Carlo Ponti for many years. She was the Italian bombshell, won an Academy Award. Cary Grant, you know, he was the good-looking guy from from the U.K. who was in the, uh, the romantic comedies, Never even won an Oscar, though, however, just a uh, um, honorary Oscar. Never won an Oscar performance. Never had a performance worthy of an Oscar. And uh, But still, uh, a very sought-after actor. <clears throat> In the middle of that, I've also bought a book on, uh, on Padre Pio, and I'll be reading about him, too. But for the most part, I'm going to be reading about Hollywood actors and actresses from the golden age of motion pictures. That's my winter topic reading top subjects for the winter. Okay, let's go ahead and get on with today's podcast. Uh, it's a wonderful life, but not if you're Russian. And so if we're going to have an essay like this, let's start off with the movie. It's a wonderful life. Okay. Uh, everybody knows about it. You know, is uh, the Frank Capra movie about, uh, the guy who runs the building and loan and he picks it up from his family and he has to, he, he's just in a big mess. He decides to kill himself, but he's rescued by an angel and the angel shows him what his life would be like if he hadn't been around. He has a change of heart and life is good. Okay. And the movie 1946, 1947, I forget which year it was, uh, it premiered in, but it had all the, it had the recipe to be one of the biggest movies of all time. And you think to yourself, well, strong it was. Not exactly. I mean, the movie starred Jimmy Stewart, who it was who he was one of the biggest Hollywood actors out there until World War II hit. He went into service. And this was his first movie after returning from the battlefield. Okay. It also starred Donna Reed up-and-coming actress. It also starred uh, Lionel Barrymore, who 
uh, from the iconic Barrymore family. It was directed by Frank Capra, one of the most iconic directors in motion picture history. So the movie had every ingredient of a hit when it opened right before Christmas time. But then by the new year, a little over a week later, it was a flop. In fact, so much of a flop that when the copyright on this film expired, nobody even bothered to renew the copyright. It was that forgettable. It was so forgettable, nobody cared about it after the copyright ran out. And the fact that they didn't renew the copyright may well be the reason that this is one of the most iconic Christmas movies of all time. Because uh, that movie, It's a Wonderful Life, fell into public domain, okay, after 28 years. So let's see, let's say, was it 46 or 47? Let's say it was 46. 46 plus 28 years in 1964, it became public domain, okay? Public domain means you can take this movie and show it and you don't have to pay royalties to the owner because it's public domain. Anybody who wants to view it can. And so after it's released, television stations started looking at this thing. They thought, you know what? We can show this movie as often as we want to, and we don't have to pay a penny in royalties. Now, it wasn't that Frank Capra or Jimmy Stewart or the enduring power of cinema that made it a lasting success. Actually, what made It's a Wonderful Life a lasting success was neglect. Yeah. I mean, it's around that time of the year when Americans return to a certain black and white film released in 1946. Was it, what did I say, 46, 47? Yeah, 46. Uh, and demand for It's a Wonderful Life on streaming platforms and linear networks over the past four holiday seasons was 11 times greater than the average movie. I think I said 64. That'd be 74, which makes more sense, okay? That's when the movie uh, became public domain. But... This is one of the most popular movies played. In fact, it's 11 times more popular than the average movie around Christmas time. That's according to a research firm called Parrot Analytics. It's easily the oldest title on Parrot's top 10 and right up with there their with Home Alone among Christmas movies that we can't stop watching. And that's odd for lots of reasons. Now, one of the reasons is it's not exactly elf, you know, a light comedy. It's kind of a dark film. I mean, think about it. It's like a financially devastated businessman who meets a guardian angel uh, when he's trying to kill himself and he gets a peek at the world as, as if he never existed. And again, it was also a big time disappointment. I mean, legendary director, Frank Capra, legendary actor, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, in fact, they have a big publicity blitz. It was on the cover of Newsweek. It was the cover on the cover of Life. Life magazine even had a big spread to promote the movie. But it just fizzled at the box office. In fact, It's a Wonderful Life lost money. Okay? But three decades later, it was saved by a Hollywood miracle. And again, that Hollywood miracle, the film was protected by copyright for 28 years, and the copyright holder could fill out the paperwork and renew it for another 28 years. That's all he had to do, fill out the paperwork. Didn't have to pay money, just fill out the paperwork. But they didn't even want to do it because the movie wasn't making any money. Nobody wanted to take the time and effort to do it. So in 1974, it entered public domain. Now, the closest that a movie could get to declaring itself, itself a failure also happened to explain why it's unlikely turnaround. TV stations could run it whenever they pleased, as often as they wanted. They could run it 24-7 if they wanted to and didn't have to pay anybody a penny. So they did. And so they played it so much, people watched it, and they thought, you know what? This is a cute movie after all. It's a new generation. And it became very popular because it was very free. Now, today, movies are protected with a copyright of, I think I want to say 95 years, something like that, so... That whole 28 years falling into public domain doesn't apply. 
But back then, that's not the way the law worked. Now, since they passed some law and Frank Capra or his estate, I'm sure, or whoever owns the movie, they now have the rights to it again because of some law. It gave, they took it out of public domain. I don't know how they did that, but they did. Uh, that was some type of Supreme Court decision, I want to say. But uh, but the fuse has been lit. The cobra's out of the cage. And now that once very boring, very loser of a movie, It's a Wonderful Life, is now a winner that everybody wants to watch. But had it not gone into public domain in 1974, I doubt that that would have been the case. So that's part one of today's essay. It's a wonderful life. And it is for me. It is for you. It is, I would say, I would at least hope that it is for everybody listening to the sound of my voice. But not if you're in Russia. Last week I did an essay and we talked a bit about the Russian-Ukraine war. Now, don't get me wrong. The, the war is no holiday for the Ukrainians either. I mean, they were the ones who had their country invaded. I would say those soldiers were there fighting against the, against the Russians for patriotism, for love of, of Mother Ukraine, for defending their country against the aggressor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Russians, quite frankly, if you can believe what you read, most of those Russian soldiers don't even want to be there. Case in point, there was a, it's a POW. His name is, I'm probably going to butcher his name, but let's try it anyway. Uh, Yevgeny Chavalik. Mr. Shavilak, I mean, he recalls receiving a phone call back in October of this year. And the phone call said, hey, report to duty north of Moscow. Even though you're working in a steel plant, you're done. You're now drafted. You're in the Army now, son. And within days, he was transferred to a military base east of Moscow, where he said the training mainly consisted of standing for hours on parade grounds and learning how to make a bed. Now, soon after this, he said his unit was on its way to what they were told would be further training in the uh, Belgorod region near Ukraine. But he said he knew he had already crossed the border when he got out of his transport vehicle for a cigarette break. We quote Mr. Chevelyuk. He says, it wouldn't have made any difference to say anything, he said, because we're already there and there was no place to run. He was captured uh, near the Ukraine's uh, Luhansk region and is now held in a camp with other Russian prisoners more than 1,000 miles from home. Now, if you remember, when Russia had all these problems with the Ukraine making all these gains in the east, Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered to call up some 300,000 new soldiers to plug gaps in the front line, and it actually did slow Ukraine's advance this fall. Now, underscoring the importance of raw numbers in a war has become largely that of attrition. Now, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoji said on Friday that Russia's armed forces would boost its numbers to 1.5 million. Does this sound familiar? Look at what Russia did during World War II. They just threw more people at the Germans. Russian troops versus German casualties in World War II. What were they, 8, 9, 10, 12 to 1, something like that? But they had the people. Millions of Russian troops died. Millions, tens of millions of Russian troops died. But they just kept feeding them into the meat grinder, and they wore down the Germans. That's what Putin's trying to do now. 300,000 they called up. They're going to call up another 1.5 million troops to throw at the Ukrainian army. Now, Russia's experience in drafting fresh troops this year has exposed many of the problems plaguing Russians' military. And some of those caught up in the draft said, from poor training to shoddy equipment and cases of alcohol abuse. Now, in the first weeks of this uh, new draft back in September, some recruitment officers stripped, uh, skipped medical chest tests to get the soldiers quickly to Ukraine and shore up Russia's crumbly positions. This is according to the people that were drafted. At times, mobilized soldiers like Mr. 
Chevelyuk, said that they were told to stay in Russia for exercises only to realize from the road signs that, uh, yep, we're not in Russia, we're in Ukraine. So they were just lied to. Get in this, tr- get in this truck, we're going to drive you to, cl- in, to some other place in Russia across the border, b- right before the border for more training. And then when the truck stopped, they said, yep, you're in Ukraine now, get out and let's start fighting. They just lied to them, okay? Now, military analysts say the draft has helped shore up Russian positions after a summer of heavy fighting in Ukraine's eastern Donbass region, and Moscow is now working to strengthen up its lines and push westward where it can. But here's what's also happened by throwing all these troops onto the front line. It's siphoned working-age men out of the labor force, prompting Russia's central bank governor to, government to warn last week that inflation could begin to rise next year. Now, many Russians have also headed to Kazakhstan, Armenia, Georgia, and other nations just to avoid the draft. And that, too, drains the labor pool. <coughs> For those that have been drafted, the extent to which they've been trained and equipped uh, as when they're sent to fill the holes in the Russian defenses have varied wildly from unit to unit. Some receiving little or no training as their commanders pushed them into a a system that had little capacity to absorb them. The net result raises questions over Moscow's broader war effort. They cut lots of corners at the beginning of mobilization to get people into the units as soon as possible, sending people in some cases with just days of training. That's according to Dara Messascott. She's a, uh, or he's a senior policy researcher with Rand Corp, a U.S. nonpartisan think tank. Now, a Russian officer said some commanders have been forced to mobilize soldiers, have forced mobilized soldiers to buy their own clothes and gear because they didn't have any supplies. So not only have you been drafted and you're in the army, but they make you buy your own clothes, make you buy your own equipment. In some cases, his lack of training has caused protests amongst the troops, and that leads to individual criminal cases being pursued against those who speak out or lead other soldiers against the commanding officers. Some of the mobilized soldiers have been lined up, and those who have spoken out are disciplined publicly. In other words, they're made examples of. This is what happens when you don't toe the line. Now, the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defense said in early November that Russia was having difficulties absorbing the trainees. Experienced officers, get this, experienced officers and trainers have been deployed to fight in Ukraine, and some have likely been killed in the conflict. So now, whether a larger fighting force can help reverse Moscow's battlefield setbacks since Mr. Putin ordered the invasion in February will largely depend on the training and support the draftees received in long winter months, both on the front lines and in support roles further back. Now, let's get back to the experience of Mr. Chevelyuk and other prisoners. They spoke freely uh, out of earshots of the guards and suggested that that there's a deep-seated problem that will be difficult for the Russians to quickly address. During his brief training, Mr. Chevelyuk said his company had one day of target practice with semi-automatic rifles, and he was only given two magazines of ammunition. It was clear no one cared. The commanders weren't giving any orders at all, and plenty of them were just drinking, says Mr. Chevelyuk, who's 29 and did briefly serve in the military back in 2016. So the guy knows something about the military. He's been there before. Now, he also described how for weeks he was on the front line and orders were contradictory and often relayed by people he and his fellow officers or fellow soldiers couldn't even identify as commanding officers. He said his position uh, near the Ukraine's Lungask region was encircled while other soldiers in the unit were taking care of an injured officer. I personally didn't see any commanders. One person runs up and tells you something. Someone else runs up and tells you something different. Another draftee in the same prison said he got separated from his commanding officer during an attack by Ukraine forces. He said he was approached by a Russian-speaking Ukrainian soldier in the basement of where he'd been hiding. After being taken prisoner, uh, he was transferred to the live prison. He said neither he nor others went through medical checkups and they were drafted, and some of those who were drafted had serious medical condition. One soldier, he said, had epilepsy. They gave him pills and said, get out there and fight. Quote, they need to recruit people 
to report to their bosses and the government that they got their 300000 but they didn't care who they were or where they got them. That's according to that other prisoner. Now, a third capture sol- captured soldier said he didn't recall any major problems and said they had been given debit cards to receive their salaries. He hasn't checked his debit card, so he doesn't know if he's been paid yet or not. Now, for Kiev, additional waves of Russian soldiers coming in at the end of winter when Ukrainian troops have been exhausted by months and months of fighting could still be a significant threat, regardless of how much training these new troops have had. Now, according to uh, the head of the Ukraine Security and Defense Council, he says, look, mobilization is very serious, and I don't agree with those who dismiss them as a bunch of alcoholics. In other words, 300,000 troops is 300,000 troops. 1.5 million troops are 1.5 million troops, whether they're well-trained or not. That's a lot of soldiers. But it's causing a big problem for the, for the, for the country. I mean, there's nobody left in run. Those that aren't running uh, go to the front line, and there's nobody to run the factories. So there's a huge, huge problem in Russia. And with the exception of the Chinese and the Indians and a handful of other countries, Russia is getting very little support from the rest of the world. So if you're in Russia, it's certainly not a wonderful life. But what about the rest of Europe? Because if you remember, if you remember, Russia was going to go ahead and cut off the natural gas supply. The Europeans wouldn't be able to run their country because they were very dependent on Russian natural gas. And the Russians were going to go ahead and starve and freeze Europe out. In theory, Europe would be forced to say, okay, we're not going to support Ukraine. Give us the gas. And then Russia could go ahead and do what they wanted because Europe was not supporting Ukraine. Well, Europe has come up with an alternative to Russian natural gas, okay? And so far, they've passed their first test without Russian energy. They've kept the lights on through this month's cold blast here in December. Uh, How did they do it? Coal. (laughs) Yeah, they're burning more coal than they've burned in years. They couldn't get gas, so they're now burning coal. Now, consuming large amounts of coal represents a difficult choice for European nations that had promised to ditch the carbon-intensive fuel to contain climate change. Well, when Russia cut the natural gas supply after invading Ukraine, um, and outages at French nu- outages at French nuclear plants, well, if we can't get nuclear, if we can't get natural gas, we've always got coal. So they're burning it in record numbers. In fact, European demand is one reason why the world is on track for record coal consumption in 2022, the International Energy Agency reported. Coal will continue to be the global energy system's largest single source of carbon dioxide emissions so far. In 20, uh, they wanted to flatline this thing, but it's not happening. Now, the effects of war have turbocharged coal's comeback, but a flaw in Europe's approach to the transition towards renewable energy Sources of energy have also played a role. The continent has invested in wind and solar while closing down dozens of coal-fired plants over the last decade, which is fine, except for the when the wind doesn't blow and it's cloudy. And demand is high. Europe really doesn't have the capacity to maintain electricity supplies from clean sources. They just can't do it. In fact, at that point, power prices rise to encourage utilities to fire up the fossil fuel plants. Used to be natural gas. They can't get that, so now it's coal. Now, whenever there's a high power demand, you ramp up coal as much as possible, and it jumps into the system before the gas plants. That's according to Powell Shiznak, uh, the analyst at at, at Ember. That's a think tank that aims to expedite the shift away from coal. Coal use this month when icy cold weather quieted uh, wind farms and strained the electrical system. In Europe, in fact, the EU generated 22% of its power from coal and its sister fuel lignite, which is a brown coal that uh, that they have over there in Europe. That was in the first two weeks of December. That's up from 17% the period before last year and 15% back in 20 the whole of 2021. In Europe's intercontinental market, coal power flowed across the borders. In fact, at times, the the UK, Great Britain, meets more than half of its demand with wind. However, the demand fell to less than, from, from more than half to 4%. Demand jumped 
the wind stopped blowing and they had to fire up coal-fired furnaces to generate the electricity. Now, the first two weeks of December, generated uh, Germany generated 49% more power with coal and 6% more with lignite than in the period a year before. It's a security of supply issue across Europe, and the Germans had some plants that they could bring back, so that's what they did. If the Germans didn't deliver, then the French would have had a problem. Because what happened with the French, the French used to export lots of electricity because they have nuclear power. However, they had a problem with some of their nuclear power plants. Uh, they were down for maintenance, and they found, because they're getting old, they found problems. They couldn't bring them up in time. So France, not only could France not export electricity like they normally did, they had to import electricity. So it became a double negative. Europe was depending on France, and then France couldn't deliver because they couldn't get the nuke plants up and going. Batteries can't store enough power when the wind speeds drop. So they got to have coal. Again, that's according to uh, Peter de Pus. He's a program leader for the fossil fuel transition think tank E3G in Europe. Building more grid connections so renewable power can be funneled across the border is a key also. But again, if the sun don't shine and the wind don't blow, you got to burn coal because there is no gas. Europe was on track to consume more coal for the second year running before the recent freeze. It imported fuel from Colombia. Indonesia, and South Africa, because like natural gas, they're not buying coal from Russia either. In fact, the Pol Poland's government in particular is touting coal as a way to keep the economy running while war wages in, nuclear, in neighboring Ukraine. The country accounts for more than 40% of the EU hard coal, hard coal demand and has, has clashed with Brussels over its uh, desire to stick with coal plants and mines. So basically, Poland's saying, look, we're just going to burn coal. Because we have to survive. But it's not clean. But we have to survive. Now, in April, when Russia cut natural gas supplies to Poland, the Polish government dropped a ban on burning ligite and poor quality coal at home. An election rally in September, Jaroslaw Kaczynski, the leader of the ruling Law and Justice Party, encouraged voters to, quote, burn whatever's necessary to keep warm except for tires. He did draw the line there. Don't burn tires, okay? Everything else, yeah, go ahead and burn it. What the heck? We need to keep warm. Poland in the wintertime, friends, is no picnic. It's not a matter of convenience. If you don't heat your home, you will die. Now, whether or not Poland will have sufficient amounts of coals really depends on how severe this winter is going to be. That's according to Robert uh, Tam Tamaszewski. He's an energy analyst for Poliska Insight. Now, across Europe, industry is leaning on coal as well as oil to keep operating uh, in, a, in a time of high natural gas and power prices. Now, what's going to happen in the future? It's hard to say. But in the meantime, the EU has found a way around no Russian gas. It's called coal. Is it dirty? Sure. But it's helping out, and it's doing the job. Last but not least, I want to go ahead and end on a... It's not really a positive note. I, maybe it's not a negative note. It's just a note. And as we wind down the year, I'm going to end it on a James Strong, pompous ass, see, I told you so note. Some weeks ago, I did a number of podcasts on quiet quitting. Quiet quitting was a phenomenon, especially uh Younger folks were doing it. They weren't quitting their jobs, but they just weren't really working that hard because, hey, look, unemployment was low. They need me. They're going to pay me a lot of money. The economy is fantastic. They're not going to fire me. I'm not going to work real hard. So basically, while I'm not quitting my job, I'm kind of just collecting a paycheck. I'm quitting quietly and still collecting the paycheck. Well, I said be careful because the worm will turn Friends, the world is turning right now. And if you think about what is the biggest industry that is going to, in theory, eliminate the most semi-skilled workers out there. In fact, Andrew Wang, who ran for president uh, and, and lost in the Democratic primary, wanted to pay everybody a base pay because, look, Real soon, we're going to have all these self-driving trucks and all the truck drivers are going to be out of work. What are they going to do? They're not going to be able to write code. 
they're going to starve to death if we don't give them money. It was a, a company called Too Simple. Okay, Too Simple, they make a self-driving, they're a self-driving truck company. Now, they don't make the trucks, but they make the software that goes into the self-driving trucks, okay? They're a huge deal. They're a big deal. They're the leaders in the industry. Um, they now plan to potentially cut at least half of its workforce next week. People familiar with the matter said is it scales back efforts to build and test autonomous truck driving system. Now, a staff, staff reduction of that size would likely affect about 700 employees, and the people said the cuts could go even deeper than that. As of June, Too Simple had over 1,400 full-time employees globally. They have operations in San Diego, Arizona, Texas, and China. Okay. So the company that was going to revolutionize truck driving and get rid of all the truck drivers is laying off all its people because this stuff just isn't working. So if you were a Weisenheimer who said, ah, these stupid truck drivers, I'm going to go ahead and design this software that just gives these knotheads no opportunity. It's not working. And in fact, you, if you quiet quitted, you're probably out because they don't want you. They're cutting at least half the staff. Um, my advice to those who are getting fired from two simple holdings, uh, I think I know where you can get a job tomorrow. <clears throat> you can apply as a job for a truck driver. <laughs> karma, my friends, karma indeed. And let's go to part two of this. Uh, the West Coast tech, tech workers. Again, I'm not wringing my hands and laughing at these people much but the wall street journal interviewed one person who was laid off recently they were earning a six-figure salary uh and they were laid off from the tech industry and now they got their hand out want mom and dad to help them out there was another person interviewed who made a contingency plan that included living out of a camper to save money a third had two years worth of savings and um they're holding out. They just want to find the right job. Now, people are going through layoffs in the West Coast tech industry, and they're in wide-ranging positions, most of which they're uncomfortable one way or another. So if they're not laid off or fired, they might be soon. And these are good jobs, five- or six-figure jobs that they have, have or had, okay? Now, some folks are humbly accepting assistance when they never expected to need it. Others have... Financial security, who have financial security, are falling into awkward conversations with recently unemployed friends and former coworkers who aren't even as well off as them. And they need to decide, do they just jump at the first job or do they wait for the new wonderful job that lets them just do what they were doing? Tech workers, young people, please, 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 I'm not... I'm not I'm not trying to belittle you. I'm not trying to berate you. I'm not trying to laugh at you saying, see, Professor Strong told you so. But here's the way the workforce has always worked. It's always worked this way. It will always work this way. Okay. If you have a skill, if you have skill A, and skill A is in demand, that's wonderful. But then if something happens where skill A goes by the wayside and is no longer needed, and many in your industry are laid off, you don't look for new employment that needs people with skill A because everybody's getting rid of those people. Those that have their jobs are keeping them, and they're not hiring new ones. So what do you have to do? It's always been this way. You go to skill B. You reinvent yourself. You do something different. You do something new. You do something that you maybe never thought of. Or you do something that's that's kind of related, okay? Kind of related. Case in point, if if you worked for the uh, the company, New Simple, the uh, the self-driving trucking software company, I have to know, I have to think now you know something about trucks, Okay because you're designing software that lets them drive by themselves. Now, there's a shortage. In fact, they're, they're, kind of, they're getting rid of these self-driving trucks. That's kind of gone by the wayside. Not to say it'll never happen, but it's not happening right now. How do you reinvent yourself? Well, if you know something about trucks, why don't you go to Navistar or Ford or Chrysler or General Motors 
and work for a trucking company or a company that builds trucks. Maybe you won't build the software that self-drives them. Maybe you can work on the software that uh, works the radar that uh, lets the truck... uh, that, 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 that beeps at you when there's a truck that's close by. What, what's the name of it? I can't think of the name of it. You know what I'm talking about. The uh, uh, the, the, so, the software, that, that it's a safety software, okay? Uh, you notice that on the new cars, as, as you go to, uh, if you're going to pass pass a, a vehicle, if you look over the other lane, you don't see a car, but if there's something in your blind spot, the mirror says, nah, I don't do this right now because there's a car back there, okay? There's sensors on all the new cars that tell you this. Work for those people. That's software on trucks, software on on cars but if you look in the mirror and say nope i design software for self-driving trucks and there's no companies out there that are hiring software people to design software for self-driving trucks you my friend will be back in mommy's basement sitting in your pea-stained underwear playing video games maybe that's what you want i don't know try your best to reinvent yourself okay the worm has turned. It's always been that way. Nothing's new. I, my whole life, I've worked in manufacturing. And if, if any industry has evolved and changed, it's been manufacturing. Okay? Self-driving trucks, that software is no different. Well, that's it. We're done. Uh, it's the 23rd of December. Uh, I, I suspect I'll do another podcast between now and the end of the year. I don't think I will do another podcast between now and Christmas. So let me wish each and every one of you Merry Christmas, perhaps Happy New Year, and uh, we'll see you the next time. James Strong Show at Hotmail.com. That's the email address. Send me your email address. I will respond to your email. In fact, if you get, send me an email, we can just talk. Uh, if you want me to uh, send you a link to the podcast, I can do that. Then you can download it and listen to it at your leisure right after it drops. That's it. We're done. Merry Christmas. Until next time, this is James Strong saying, adios.